Good morning, dear saints, and blessed Easter. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Wednesday, May 8th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Today we are tackling Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. Solomon teaches in these Proverbs about the balance between human-laid plans and God's will. Though people make their own plans and assess their own intentions, it is God who ultimately guides their steps, sees into their hearts, and determines their paths. This passage urges humility and trust in God's wisdom while striving to live righteously. It reminds us that God leads the faithful and rewards those who follow His guidance. Over the air in St. Louis, live and on demand at KFUO.org or through the KFUO mobile app, or maybe via your favorite podcasting service, there are so many ways to connect to God's Word through Thy Strong Word and other fantastic programs on KFUO. So thank you for tuning in, and thank you for sharing your love of the program with your friends and family. Now, settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We are about to begin. Thy Strong Word is supported by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is an organization dedicated to empowering Lutheran communities worldwide through translation, publication, and distribution of crucial Christian texts. LHF has made significant strides in translating Foundation Lutheran works like Luther's Small Catechism, A Child's Garden of Bible Stories, and others into over 145 languages, making these resources accessible to believers around the world. Their efforts ensure that everyone can explore the depths of Scripture and the Lutheran faith in their native language. So discover the far-reaching impact of LHF by visiting them online at lhfmissions.org. That's lhfmissions with an S on the end, dot org. Now, if you have any questions or comments about today's show while you're online checking out LHF Missions, be sure to shoot me an email, pastorboo at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook. You can just search for Phil Boo. There's actually a couple Phil Boos out there, but you'll know the one. You'll know which one's me. And <laughs> you can send me a, a message or a friend request. If you do those things while the show's on the air, there's a good chance I can get your question out. You can also just sort of skip the line and call right into the studio. That number is 1 800 730 2727. Well, turning to our guest this morning. It is, well, returning contributor to the show, the Reverend Dr. Curtis Dieterding. He's the pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Good morning, Pastor Dieterding. Welcome back to the show. It's good to be back. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to it as we continue here through Proverbs. Um, I've been (laughs) been reading these Proverbs again today. Um, So much wisdom and so much uh, so much meat in this, in, in just each and every one of these proverbs. So I'm, I'm looking forward to our visit with uh, with each other on these. Well, I'm certainly hoping so, because uh, as people may have noticed, you have nine, <laughs> nine proverbs, and we got to uh, do that in an hour. It reminds me of a time when I was a guest on uh, uh, Sharper Iron with, with uh, host Timothy Apple, and yeah. uh, he gave me, I think, Amos 1 through 8, and Boy, I tell you what, it was. I thought that was rough. But, you know, the Proverbs really are, really the whole Bible is just full of wisdom. And when you take those things and use them as springboards to other wonderful places in the Bible, yeah, it's pretty easy to fill an hour. But I will tell you this, completely off topic, completely off topic. Um, I had a visitor parishioner the other day, and I thought about you because she okay. said that she had a friend who is going into Egypt. In fact, he lives in Egypt. He's having to come back for visa reasons. Uh, but he's an American missionary. He's going into Egypt. And he's starting uh, basketball camps as a route to, you know, minister to people about God in a Muslim country where otherwise that's fairly frowned upon. And I thought about you because I know that you have your doctorate in missiology, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with a with a with a, a focus on basketball. Actually, I, I'm not. I'm I'm far from basketball. My focus is on soccer, actually. <laughs> so, Are you kidding me? I always uh, thought you were a basketball guy. No, no. Yeah, see, I don't look anything like my voice. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not very tall at all. I'm actually very short, and um, I've not really been much of a basketball player. No, I've been in uh, soccer, and uh, my doctor's actually a doctor in ministry. Um, it's a doctor of uh, ministry and homiletics, actually. Am I mistaking you for someone then? There you must, must be. be. You, you, 
must be. There's 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 other Dieter Dings too, but uh, there's only one <laughs> other. There's there's only two other pastors. One of them's my brother, so we're not. Neither one of us are basketball players, and the oh, other one no. is a cousin. So. And I thought that was a great segue too. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> I should have just ran with it. You know. <laughs> yeah, you should have been like, oh, yeah, of course. But, but well, keeping to the point, though, because I do think there is a guest, and maybe it's not you. Maybe it's not you, but there, well, obviously it's not. But there is a guest that does have that. But I, I want to bring up the point anyway, and that is that sometimes, you know, going out and ministering to people doesn't always look like just uh, going and just flat out telling them about Jesus. There are places in this world where that's forbidden, and, and while we need not to be ashamed we also want to be strategic about the way we share it so that we can you know obviously have that opportunity and so i just thought that was kind of fascinating um because today in proverbs a little section we have is talking about you know the things that we intend in this world to do the plans Mm -hmm. that we make and of course the way that god uses even our feeble plans for his glory and of course if we don't do things according to god's will uh, well we shouldn't really expect success Mm -hmm. well even even whenever you even when you think you're following God's will, uh, God may make some twists and turns that you had never expected. And um, there was a point, you, as you were talking, it reminded me that there was a point in my ta- in my life when I got to the end of my college career where I was um, getting ready to prepare to become a missionary over in Taiwan. And mm-hmm. I remember uh, going, getting ready to go over to Concordia College in uh, Milwaukee to learn Mandarin Chinese, and instead uh, a young lady walked into my life, and I had my teaching degree, and uh, we got together. Before you know it, plans had changed. Instead of a mission going into the mission field overseas, I ended up going into the mission field in southern Florida in oh. Miami. <laughs> so I'm like, well, that's pretty close, actually. You know, there's a well, lot. Well, I was of going to say, right. <laughs> a lot of different nationalities that gather in Miami. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity that the Lord placed before me and uh, just gave me a complete different direction, uh, along with my wife, who was also a school teacher. And so you don't know, even even when you think you've got a handle on where you're going and what you're going to do as far as bringing the gospel to people, you, you sometimes you really don't. You have no idea. No, and you never know what the Lord is going to do and, and how he's going to use you. And so, yeah, it's just it's fascinating the way that we go out. We, we have maybe all these, uh, as I like to say, best laid plans, right? We have all these exactly. best laid plans, and God has a way of both, well, affirming our plans when they're in accordance with what he wants to accomplish, but also, and probably more often, uh, changing those plans to accomplish what he wants, exactly. which is why we pray, thy will be done in the Lord's Prayer. Yep, that's what? exactly it. So, yeah, so, yeah it's, about the, it's about the plans of man and the plans of the Lord. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Well, let's, uh, let's not delay too much longer then. Go ahead and start us off with a prayer, and then we'll dive in. Okay. Lord God, you know our hearts. You know our minds. You know what we think and how we feel. You know every word before it even comes off our lips. We pray that you would be with us with a special portion of your Spirit working through your Word this day to really hear what your Word tells us concerning your plans for us and how our plans aren't always the plans that you have for us. Help us to walk in such a way that we truly hear the Word and continue to grow in the wisdom of that Word, that we might serve you most effectively with our lives, always led by your Spirit. This we pray in the one who has guided us through this life, through his words, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Once again, I'd like to apologize to my guest for uh, misremembering what his doctorate was in. And I'd like to also apologize to the actual person I was thinking of. By the way, that's the Reverend Dr. Vernon Wint. Um, oh, he has okay. a PhD in missiology, and he has a dissertation on basketball and missions. So I don't, I don't know why I thought that was you. But, interesting. Uh, no, but, but yeah, either. It is, it is interesting, though, when I talk to him about it on the air and, and off the air, I think, because, you know, it's just uh, you don't think of those kinds of things. And I'm not really a no. big sports guy, so uh, it's just fascinating. 
But but you're no stranger being, a, you know, a, a, a missionary and, and a church planter and that sort of thing, kind of. And so uh, let's talk about best laid plans as Solomon reveals them to us in the Proverbs. All right, let me open my Bible. Here we go. So 16 from Proverbs, English Standard Version is what I'm going to be reading from. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from Yahweh, from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but Yahweh weighs the spirit. Commit your work to Yahweh and your plans will be established. There we go. There's the first three verses. So the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from Yahweh. As often is the case in these uh, poetic types of wisdom literature, it, that might need a little unpacking to completely understand, but I think we're getting the gist. What is Solomon talking about? Well, in that in that very first verse, you know, we make all kinds of plans, and, and you alluded to it earlier, too, as we were talking, um, that, you know, we, we can have all kinds of plans, and yet... That you know, as often as it happens, is that our plans are not as pure as uh, as they should be, and sometimes uh, we have our own ideas about what's good, what's right, what's what's truth, even. But the only answer of truth and good and purity all comes from the tongue of the Lord. In other words, the Lord's word, the Lord's plans. The Lord is is perfect. His answer is the answer. It's like absolute, you know. He knows what our, what those plans are going to be for us, where we can sit and plan all, all day. And just like we just were t- discussing, um, the, the plans of man are not pure like the Lord's. Uh, they're not always uh, exactly going to come out the way they are. Cause Quite frankly, I mean, if you're just focusing in on how you're going to make plans or what you're going to do with your life, um, you you don't always have control of everything around you. Whereas the Lord, whenever he speaks, you know, his word does not return to him empty. It, it will be accomplished. Whatever he sets out uh, to do, it will be done. And so, yeah, there's a, I think there's a lot of truth in the fact that, that this word that's being spoken by the Lord is, the, is a word that uh, is is going to be fulfilled, whereas we can't always fulfill whatever words we might make and the promises that we might make. You know, I one of the references, the cross-references here in the ESV takes us to Matthew 10. Um, and so I looked over there, and I'm like, well, okay, what's this have to do with it? And um, it's Jesus. And he's saying, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious about how you are to speak or even what you are to say, mm-hmm. for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Now, I, I get the connection, um, whoever the editors were who made that connection. Obviously, it's the Lord guiding the tongue there. The answer of the tongue is from Yahweh. My, my thought is th- there seems to be a misunderstanding sometimes of, on the one hand, God is going to work his will. Um, but at, at the same time, we are still supposed to seek to do the will of the Lord ourselves, not just sort of wait around for God to act. In the same way, Jesus tells us, don't be worried about what you're going to say when you're brought before kings and councils, but mm-hmm. it doesn't preclude us from studying and being in the word so that he does give us those words to speak. So I guess there has to be a balance here, right, brother, about, yes, of course we rely on the word and we rely on the Lord, but at the same time, we don't want to just sit around waiting for him to act. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, you know, I think when, I, when it says here that the plans of the heart, you know, I mean, I, th- I think it's just talking about, the, you know, we as humans, uh, sinful humans, we make plans in our heart. Uh, but what's really pure is the tongue of the Lord. You know, what I mean, right, so right. so and I think I think that's going along the same line of what you're saying, because the Lord can even work through our stupidity. You know, I mean, <laughs> he can even work when we're not pure, when we're not doing what, what needs to be done, he can still work through that, and, and his will is going to get done one way or another, whether it be for you, for someone else around you, whatever, you know, but um, that doesn't mean that we should uh, just be aloof, uh, but, but like you said, you know, our wisdom really is, is the fear of the Lord, right, the, uh, seeking out mm-hmm. the fear and fearing the Lord and seeking his wisdom. 
And uh, our heart does not naturally do that. We have to go outside of ourselves to find the truth. One thing we as sinners do a very good job of is rationalizing our behavior and our motives and intentions. But God, he, he knows the heart. Verse 2 again, all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but Yahweh weighs the spirit or perhaps spirits there. Regardless, you know, God knows deep within our intentions. In fact, we may even be convinced by our own rationalizations. We may not think that we're rationalizing. We've just simply talked ourselves into it. But I guess Solomon's reminding us here that the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, and I, you know, I can't help but think of the the passage about deceiving ourselves. You know, uh, if you think that you're perfect and pure and holy, uh, take take another look because uh, all of the thoughts and, the, and and what's in the heart of man is are not. And uh, so, so sometimes I think we think that we're just great people. You know, we I'm, <laughs> I'm doing my best. I'm doing good. I've got all these plans of how I'm going to serve the Lord and. And uh, they could be really ugly because we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing when it comes to taking care of the of the people around us. You know, I, I tell people sometimes because I'm like, um, you know, I think we get selective about what we're willing to do as far as our mission work and, and serving the Lord. Uh, we make the decision as to how much we're going to do or how much my time I'm willing to give. It's like... Um, how about praying to the Lord that he would guide and lead you to know ways that you can use your gifts in, in ways to serve him? You know, where's the starting point with me first, you know, kind of making those decisions? Even if we're doing what we think is good and right, uh, might not necessarily be the proper motive. The proper motive is, are we truly seeking the Lord's you know, tongue, his truth, what his word, or are we truly trying to find our own way uh to doing the things the Lord wants us to do. I think, I think that's what I'm trying to say right there is, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't know how else to put that. It's just that I think that, that we get caught up sometimes in thinking that what we, what we do is, is always good and right. And yet, um, it's almost like we, we evaluate ourselves rather than just say, Lord, use me and, and see what, what comes from that. You know, it kind of reminds me a little bit, and this is tangentially. I mean, I think I think your point is well made. I also think about those spiritual inventories that some churches do, and perhaps yours does too. Uh, and I'm not saying um, anything negative about them. In fact, they're sometimes very useful to determine what you might have the skills or interest in doing. But I also think that sometimes when people do those, they pigeonhole themselves. Like, this is what I'm being called to do, mm-hmm. and I can only mm-hmm. do this, or something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. But verse 3, which I think backs up exactly what you're saying, commit your work to Yahweh and your plans will be established. Meaning they're, the plans of the heart, the ones that we rationalize, the ones that don't come from God's word, uh, certainly are destined to fail. But even when we go out and do whatever we're going to do, if we do that committed to Yahweh, then he'll establish our plans. But that committing to Yahweh means something. How, how would you describe what it means to commit our work to Yahweh? Yeah, so, you know, really, if you look up at verse 1 and verse 3, I mean, there, you know, you can see the wisdom of what's being said here in, the, in, these, in these Proverbs. Because the, the, in, verse, in verse 1 of chapter 16, you've got the heart that belongs to man, okay, that makes plans, right? And then in verse 3, these plans were made because you committed to the Lord and His will, you know. So it's it's the I, I see like it's the will of man, the will of God, and if we're committing to the will of the Lord, then your plans will be the Lord's plans. You know, kind of like um, I'm thinking of Romans chapter 12. You know, there in the very very first part where it's talking about seeking out, you know, God's will. You know, being transformed by the by the Spirit in our minds. Um, again, it's always looking at the Spirit, looking at God's will, looking at Him first, and His plans will become our plans uh, in, the, in a sense that, that, you know, we're at least seeking in the right place rather than just seeking in our own hearts. It brings to my mind John 16. Jesus says, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He will give it to you. 
Until mm-hmm. now, you've asked nothing, but ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And, and we look at that and we go, oh, okay, well, God, I'd sure like a million dollars or, you know, Lord, I'd, I'd sure like a Corvette. Lord, I'd sure like a et cetera, et cetera. But we, we miss the nuance there. And that is conforming ourselves to God's will. When you ask in Jesus' name, of course, that means we know that we can only access the Father through Christ as our mediator. But it also means that we pray for the things that Christ wants us to pray for. Uh, the most recent Lutheran Witness, I think, has some great articles about in the Lord's name. But absolutely, we, mm. we, we can ask our, our God, our Father, for anything. But when we ask for the things that his spirit leads us to ask for through the word, well, then we can be guaranteed of receiving those things like life, salvation, faith, strength to overcome temptations, et cetera, et cetera. And you're right. And on the other side of that coin, you know, from those things that belong to the heart of man, just like the things you just laid out, those uh, those worldly, um, those things mm-hmm. that, that, you know, you want to gather and, and hopefully get uh, for your life, making it uh, hopefully more uh, – a more effective life that you can use these goods and all these resources maybe for the, the work of the Lord. But yeah, the first, the first look is, you know, what is the Lord's will in whatever it is that you seek to do? I, I think that's pretty much what these first three verses are really getting us to focus on. Let's add one more verse as we head toward our break. Yahweh has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked, for the day of trouble. This seems like one that we could get into some uh, sticky wickets, as they say, you know, because yep. it, it seems to say that the Lord has made the wicked. And does that mean <laughs> that he's that he's causes sin and for some sort of purpose? Yeah, this is going to need some explaining. Yeah, that, you know, when you first read this, that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like God makes wicked people. <laughs> you know, that's what it says. But no, that's not what it's actually pointing us to. It says the Lord has made everything for its purpose. And what is the purpose that God has for those who are wicked? Uh, what is that day of trouble? That day of trouble is the day uh, that um, they will be punished for their wicked deeds. And and so, that I mean, that's the way I believe in which, as I was reading through some of the commentaries, uh, that that the way in which this proverb is laid out is really referring to. Absolutely. I mean, the Lord does create things for a purpose, um, but the wicked, (laughs) they are going to see, and I think the created thing here is that day of trouble. Yeah, it's not that God made the wicked, right. It's God God made them, and they've got trouble coming. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And, and and I think it's also, as I've been trying to remind myself and the listeners, whenever we read these things, it's really easy to get into the habit of, well, we're the righteous and they out there are the wicked. And while we are saved through Christ, I think it's also a double-edged sword. We, we are also told to not seek to live the way of the wicked because of the day of trouble coming. So it's not only a, well, our God will get recompense. But it's also a, a reminder, a law, a warning to us to stay faithful, to keep seeking after the wisdom that comes from God and not Lady Folly. Yes. Yep. yep. I think That's we can get we're... one more in before the break. Five. Okay. Mm-hmm. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to Yahweh. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Well, Pastor, I've felt arrogant in heart. Mm-hmm. During my lifetime, does this mean I'm an abomination to Yahweh? When it's talking about arrogant in the heart, you know, it, this is this is interesting. I, my first thought when I read this was um, those who are self righteous. Uh, not I, I wasn't just mm-hmm. looking at at people that think I don't need the Lord and I can live my life the way I am. But I but I think it's all I think it it's all part of this. But uh, the first, the first thing that also came to my mind was um, the song "Oh Lord, It's Hard to Be Humble" when you're perfect in every way. You know, I don't know if you've, ever, I don't know if you, I don't know if you've oh ever Lord, heard that. Oh Lord, it's hard to <laughs> yeah, be humble. It. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, but I mean, there is an arrogance. There's this arrogance uh, of that, and arrogance actually separates us from a life 
from the from the Lord, and that's why it's an abomination to the Lord. One who thinks that they uh, are God unto themselves and that they've got it all straight and and right and pure, and uh, like I said, even to the point in some people with some people that uh, they don't even need the Lord. Mm-hmm. People who know and have heard and grown up, and then at one point in their life makes this decision that, um, you know, life is fine, it's good, I'm enjoying it. I don't need to spend time with the Lord. I know the Lord's my Savior. You know, I, I enjoy His creation. You know, however people uh, want to kind of spiritualize the faith rather than actually being in the Word of God and knowing what His will is and learning that will, you know, deeply into into our soul. So this is greater than, I mean, of course, it is sinful to get caught up in pride, but those occasional arrogant moments we have or pride Certainly not what the Lord wants for us, but the arrogant in heart here, if I'm hearing you correctly, really speaks to something deeper. Someone who has said, I am over and above God, and that, of course, is an abomination. Be assured he won't go unpunished. That part's interesting in the sense that is it necessary that we be assured that other people will be punished? I mean, that is Is this speaking to that sort of desire of Christians to say, you know, sometimes life as a Christian is pretty hard and and not that you you, want to share God's will that everyone is saved, but the Bible often speaks of, you know, wait, the Lord will get vengeance and that sort of thing. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. There's a part of us that says we want to be vindicated. Um, That's a tough road to hoe because we're also supposed to share God's will that all people be saved. But then again, be assured he will not go unpunished. Just an interesting assurance. I I don't know that that's something that we should be assured of, but here we have the Holy Spirit telling us. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't look at this closely enough to, to, to understand this as eternal punishment, but more of, you know, that it's going to be punished one way or another, either in this world or, like you're saying, uh, even if you stay arrogant in the heart, you know, it's an abomination to the Lord because it separates you from the Lord. But if it's if it's something that you're uh, struggling with, I think it's I think it's different. But I don't know. That's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of it in that term. It is, and I I hadn't either. I I just real quick looked at the Hebrew here. Interestingly enough, the Hebrew is talking about being empty, cleaned out, cleared Mm. out, um, almost like a a pouring out, like almost like a libation or a a drink offering. So so the unpunished does seem to say about maybe the consequences of this. Going around, living your life, if, if the context that we've been going through so far is that when you make your plans, the Lord will establish them if they're in accordance with his will, then here it, perhaps we could say uh, everyone who is arrogant, that is, makes their plans and doesn't care about God, not only is God against that, but they're go- their intentions will be cleared out, cleaned out, wiped off the board. They're not mm-hmm. going to go without mm-hmm. consequences. They won't mm-hmm. go unpunished. Perhaps mm-hmm. that's one way to that's look at it. Well, I'll tell you what, we're at time for our break at the bottom of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and take that. But folks, don't go anywhere. When we come back, Dr. Dieter Ding and I will keep on going through Proverbs 16. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Dr. Curtis Dieter Ding, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. 
And friends at home, don't forget that you can reach out at PastorBoo at gmail.com on Facebook or by phone with your comments, questions, complaints, concerns, whatever you want to talk about, as long as it has to do with Proverbs. And that number is 1-800-730-2727. Let's head back to our text. Only four more verses to go for the rest of this half hour, but lots to dig into. Um, Verse 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of Yahweh, one turns away from evil. Now, love covers a multitude of sins, we know, but steadfast love and faithfulness by those things, iniquity, sins, that is, are atoned for. Well, being a faithful follower, at least I try to be, of Jesus Christ, sounds like it's talking about Jesus. Yeah, it's definitely not talking about satisfaction or or penance or anything like that. It's talking about uh, one apart from us whose steadfast love and faithfulness has uh, atoned for us. Yeah, when you hit that word atoned, now we're we're moving into um, the work of the Lord in our lives, and uh, we can see that, you know, my love, my faithfulness falls way short of being steadfast, that's for sure. Um, as much as I might think it does, uh, there's definitely holes in it. And there are times when I'm not loving. There are times when I'm not being faithful. And so uh, we are hearing words now that are telling us that if you know you are truly in steadfast love and faithfulness, you'll find you know um, the atoning of our sins. And it's, uh, and of course, then we get to that fear of the Lord, and that's, you know, when, with the fear of the Lord, there there comes knowledge. We know that it, here, there comes wisdom. Um, it turns towards good, and towards one that's outside of us, because we know that we can't uh, turn away for, from evil on our own. And again, this is putting the Lord first, not us, not our heart, not our mind, but we're putting the Lord first committing to him and his love and his faithfulness, which turns us from evil. One of the most beloved and oft-quoted and, well, sometimes misused <laughs> phrases in all of Scripture comes from First John chapter 4. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So the Bible uses the word love over 550 times. Mm-hmm. You know, Proverbs, we've been reading through it. Hatred stirs up strife. Love covers all offenses. Peter says, above all, keep on loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, You shall love your neighbor as yourself is the fulfillment of the whole law, we see Paul say when he's writing to the Galatians. So if God God is love, though, it makes sense that he's the only one that can define what that love is. I say all those things only to bring up the very obvious point that love, as defined by the world, is an idol, is is a false idol to the world in their own definition of it. And I think we might look at this and, as you've already addressed, be tempted to say, well, as long as we're just loving to people, that's all that God cares for. So even, even say, the sin of, let's say, sex outside of marriage. Well, that's atoned for because we love each other. And how people talk, well, we're not married, but we're really in love with each other. Or uh, same-sex attraction. Well, it doesn't matter that it's not exactly what God wants because he just wants us to love one another. So love is a pretty dangerous concept in our society that, while understood rightly, draws us closer to Christ, but understood wrongly, sends us very far away from him. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and again, it, that's coming out of a man's heart. I mean, like it's coming out of, of our human heart and not God's will. Uh, the, only, the only place that we can find what is God's pure and perfect will is in his word. And there we find um, that, just like you said, you know, that, that uh, if we take love and use it for our own means— um, saying and even justifying it, you know. I mean, I'll take that a step further. I, you know, I hear people justify uh, that. How could God not not approve the fact that you know we're being faithful to each other uh, in our love? Um, you know, even when it's a situation where it's not, it's an abomination to the Lord. Actually, it's not even it's not even 
where the Lord wants us to be, because uh, His will makes that very clear. Indeed. And so I think that's just, it really ties into what, well, we started this whole thing off with. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So so we excuse, we uh, rationalize all types of things in the name of love, but love isn't just some warm and fuzzy feeling. It's it's not just the reaction to oxytocin and serotonin and dopamine in our brains. It is those things too. But it really is this self-sacrificing love that we show for other people because Christ first showed it to us. Um, and at the end of the day, though, we show love. What does Jesus say? If you are my, you are my friends, if you keep my commandments. And of course, his commandments are to love. And, and we love by following the way that God has designed us to, to live. So verse 7, when a man's ways please Yahweh, well, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Speaking of enemies, Jesus says, right, love your enemies. Mm-hmm. Boy, that's Pray really hard. Enemies. And yet, why? Because if they're humans, then at the end of the day, they're not really our enemies at all. They're people for whom Christ died, and we want to be at peace with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yep. Yeah, and, and again, we get back to when a man's ways please the Lord, and, you know, we're seeking the Lord's will and, and the Lord's peace. You know, sometimes we even use the uh, the Word of God to justify things that are wrong. <laughs> and even if we can't see it, because we are just using the Word for our own means. Um, and, of course, we learn from the Master, who did that with Jesus in the temptation there in the wilderness, using the very Word of God to... Uh, to defend where he is at, trying to get Jesus to do what he wants. Um, you know, it, on, on another level, the sinful heart is the same way. You know, we uh, will do anything to try and get our way and our will done, um, which actually always brings curse, and not blessing. If we're following God's will, and truly God will bring blessing to those... You know, I always tell uh, folks in my uh, adult class, you know, if we were to actually follow the Ten Commandments perfectly, we would know nothing but blessing in our life. But because we don't, and because we are not flawless, we are going to experience uh, all kinds of curse, um, and it's going to be, you know, God's Word is holy, and even you know, His law is holy, but... Uh, when we go according to our will, and that does reveal God's will, of course, for us, morally speaking, um, when we follow our will or even try to justify our will by his will, which is even more of an abomination, uh, we've got uh, we've got more curse in our lives than blessing. And I, I, I see that here as well. Uh, we're gonna, and, and you're going to see it as you move through the rest of this chapter, too. You'll see uh, what I'm talking about there. In, in Matthew and elsewhere, Jesus, on the Sermon of the Mount, talks about um, not resisting enemies. And that becomes really troublesome because and it, it came to my mind because you said if we lived out the Ten Commandments perfectly, we would be blessed beyond measure, something like that. And I agree 100 percent. One of the struggles, though, is that as Christians, believers, those who are, are striving to be faithful with God, at, the more we keep the commandments – Hmm. Certainly we are blessed by God. Things tend to go better. But we also live in a world where enemies will take advantage of us. And some, some people say this concept of turning the other cheek, giving your cloak, walking two miles instead of one, if we live that way, then Christians would be completely run over. We would be completely uh, uh, just dominated by the wicked in this world. And yet that's what Jesus tells us to live like. So I guess the struggle I always have is that, in this world, the more faithful you are, we're promised blessings, but we tend to get not as far as those who are willing to step on others or not as successful as those who are willing to be unscrupulous or sometimes not even as popular as those who are willing to go well along with the world's ways. So it can also be a double-edged sword. We want to be faithful, but we also know that by faithfulness comes, well, persecution and opposition. Mm-hmm. Now look what happened to Jesus. Right. The end of his life, right? I mean, yeah, and and you're 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 describing that very thing, you know. Wouldn't we just be just run right over and and persecuted and 
Uh, you know, it's like that's what Christ Christ is the ultimate example of how to treat the world. Um, you know, his very enemy standing at the foot of the cross, and he's there continually just saying, "Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing." You know, so so yeah, we can definitely see that uh, epitomized there in in uh, uh, in Christ Jesus, uh, even in his death for us who put him there. On the other hand, we do see some examples from the Old Testament where this really worked out, like on the ground. I, I'm, I'm brought to Genesis 26, verse 28 says, They said, the enemies, we see plainly that Yahweh has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you. Second Chronicles, similar thing. And the fear of Yahweh fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, and they made no war against Jehoshaphat. So there is this idea that when the Lord fights for you, when you live according to the way of the Lord, he will clear out paths. But it, I just certainly wouldn't want people to think that this is somehow a, a promise that nothing ever bad will happen, as you pointed to Jesus. And we certainly aren't above our master. But that doesn't keep us from wanting to live as God has made us live, because that's how we're supposed to operate. Right. Well, well, even you know, even when you look at the story of Jonah, you know, and you look at the, you know, he was he he didn't want the Ninevites to be saved. They were evil people. They were his enemies. He didn't he didn't want you know. He how dare the Lord would actually forgive them if they were were to actually follow His will? And that's the whole point there, you know, that they followed the will of the Lord instead of their own will at that point and turned from their ways and repented. And, you know, that's part of that whole process as well, that you know, to be able to recognize our arrogance, to recognize that our plans are, are failures, to, to recognize without God in all of that work, um, there's nothing that's really good within us. I just talked about how sometimes the unscrupulous, the wicked of this world tend to, well, get along better in the world, right? Jesus says that the world doesn't listen to us because we're not of the world. If we were, he would, they would listen to us. Well, verse 8 seems to speak to that. Solomon writes, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. And I think that speaks truth, but the trouble is one person has a hard time experiencing both of those things. <laughs> so sometimes when you have a little and you're striving to be righteous, there's still part of you that says, boy, it'd sure be nice if I was wealthy like that person. Look at all the good that I could do with all that money. But that person came by that money perhaps in, a, in an ungodly way, and mm -hmm. we can't experience the struggles they face, but the Lord tells us that they have their own issues. It's not all it's cracked up to be. Right. Yeah, I mean, well, it's where, where do you place value You know, in the world? Do you place it in things? Do you place it in in uh, the blessing of God that's promised, the eternal blessings of God, especially, you know, um, we hear those, we hear about those blessings, we're excited about that, but you know, it's not it's not tangible like the things around us that can lure us and, and, and pull us away from God's, you know, God's heart and and actually follow our own heart and. Uh, you know, that's just, just going to be a reality each and every day because um, our heart is sinful, and that's that's the thing that, uh, that that continues to be a battle. If we're not having the battle, then then there's even a bigger problem, you know. And think in it, when you're thinking in terms of what you just said, uh, but if we're thinking in terms of His righteousness. There will be a great blessing, and I like how it says, "Better is a little with righteousness, and a little in the terms of, you know, what do we have in this world?" Is the way I, you know, I understand that because of the great revenues that it says in the second part there. Right. Um, but but the righteousness is the true value; it's the true riches, and it's it's how do we see that? Where where are we in relationship to God and His thoughts, His ways? And this is a parallel to something we've already read in chapter 15, verse 16, says, Better is a little with the fear of Yahweh than great treasure and trouble with it, uh, with the great treasure. So uh, right. the idea here is the same. 
you know, it, these are these classic better than patterns, these better than parables, right? So, you know, better is X than X or Y. So, so mm-hmm. what we're not being told here is that having great revenues is evil. <laughs> and we're not saying that having very little is somehow automatically righteous either. It's just saying, as you've already pointed out a number of times, you know, if if you are going to get great wealth and revenues through injustice and the abandonment of God's ways, then, well, there's going to be trouble with that. It's not how God wants you to live. Verse 9 concludes all of our verses for today. The heart of man plans his way, but Yahweh establishes his steps. Now, folks at home might be thinking, well, why did you stop there? It's not very many verses, and that's true. But really, starting in 10 through 24, which is what we're going to talk about tomorrow, it really shifts to talking about kings and and rulers and judgments. So this is the end of kind of the theme here. And and we can tell because it is bringing us back. It's what you call a contrapuntal. The thing it began with is now being brought back. We began with the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from Yahweh. And now the heart of man plans his way, but Yahweh establishes his steps. It's so important, I think, for us to remember as Christians that that all that we have and are are to be used for God's glory. You already brought it up. It's not about what we can spare, but but you know what God has given us to work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I look at this and uh, in simple layman's terms, I would say that this is like a sandwich. You know, it's got it started with the same idea and thought in verse one as as it shows here in verse nine. I think this is a great place to stop for today uh, because it. it it's really the moral of this of this whole section you know is is that it's getting back to the initial um the initial idea the initial thought in the first proverb that's laid out there and then you've got uh you know again if if man's heart uh, plans his way in the lord uh then the lord will establish his steps and to uh, to even be able to to know and acknowledge that it's the Lord that establishes our steps, and not uh, that we do this, you know, on our own and and from our own will and our own ways of doing things. I'm always reminded of uh, of um, the uh, Isaiah chapter 55, where it talks about your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts. And I, I I've been kind of kicking that around in my mind too as I'm reading through these verses that that's exactly what it's about. If we're just seeking our own way through this world, uh, our own way through everything in the world, not just, um, you know, the good times in our lives, the the, the blessed times, the, the times that are joyous, but even the more challenging times. You know, some people just are beside themselves, um, not really dependent upon the Lord and His work and His Word in their lives at those times in their lives. And yet, the opposite is true as well. There are people that when trouble does come along in life, that's when the turn is made back to the Word because we can see that something's not going well by just my living my own life on my own, just doing my own thing, uh, that there's I need to get back to the truth that God needs to be first in my life and not me. I'm glad you brought up that verse, you know, uh, God's ways are not our ways. We often use that when something unusual happens or God brings about something uh, wonderful through an unexpected way. And we say, well, you know, the ways of the Lord are mysterious. God's ways are not our ways. Right, right. But you better define it by understanding that it's not just that God works some sorry, sometimes unusually, but that he has a way in which not only he operates, but that we are to live. When we say God's ways are not our ways, I don't think that's supposed to be a, and there's nothing we can do about it. I think it's more of a, God's ways are not our ways, therefore we should conform as much as humanly possible, aided by the Holy Spirit, we should conform to the ways of God. And this proverb, one through nine, it's been fascinating because we began and ended in the same way, as you pointed out in this sandwich, the bread, and it doesn't resolve the tension. Right, Because we see the importance of human responsibility, but the proverb also shows and teaches that outcomes are determined by God's sovereignty. 
But it doesn't make any attempt to resolve the tension between those two ideas. Both are important. What you do as a human to strive to make plans according to God's will and the fact that God will have happen what he wants to happen. I think if we if we try to pit those against each other, then we fall into a faith versus works argument that doesn't make any sense. It's like, no, we yes, we do strive to do things the right way. And we also trust in God's sovereignty, but his sovereignty shouldn't keep us from acting and nor should our acting make us think that somehow we can do better than God. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it, I, I know where you're going with that, but I'm, I'm thinking, too, that, you know, one of God's ways for us to live our lives and to live uh, as he wants us to live is to follow, um, is to follow his, his law, but doing it knowing that we have been blessed fully and richly with everything that we need through the through the work of Christ Jesus mm-hmm. if that is our motive and that's why we're we're continually concerned always about whether or not we're truly following the will of God cuz cuz just like you had pointed out i mean at, at a certain point you know, I, I think you know the, we we know that the, the the gravest sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit, not believing in God at all. But right next door to it is those who say they believe in God but have no will or desire to follow His ways at all. That's that's just as a bunch of an abomination to the Lord, and to, and that's what I believe is being said here in these verses as well. That uh, we don't just throw in the towel and say, "Well, you know, I can't really help myself because I'm a sinner, and that's why Jesus came." So I'm, you know, I'm cleared. <laughs> you know, he, he'll make sure that I, that I, uh, that I'm going to be put on track at the end of my life. So I'll worry about it then. That's <laughs> actually like, extremely. That's extremely good clarification because I wouldn't want people to think that the rules change between justification and sanctification. I, I believe right. here we're talking about what we might call sanctification. That is living out our Christian yes. life. We're justified completely and purely and 100% by God's actions, but we're sanctified 100% completely and purely by God's actions. It doesn't, the rules don't yep. change to now, well, now we help God along. But I do want to speak from the experience of the human. So, for instance, if you're in a room and I put a blindfold on you and I turn the lights on and off, on and off, on and off, and now you don't know what state the lights are in. And I say, are the lights on or off? You might say, well, I'm experiencing darkness because of this this blindfold. Therefore, I think the lights are off. You take the blindfold off and they turned out to be on. So your experience doesn't match reality. In the same way, it sure feels like we're the ones deciding to go to church, that we're the ones deciding to read our Bibles. We're the ones deciding to tune into the strong word. We're the ones that have decided to um, baptize our children. We're the ones who've decided to share Jesus with others. It feels very much like we're completely in control. But this proverb yeah. has been telling us that God is behind each of those steps. And instead of being like, oh, my goodness, my, my personal agency, my free will's at risk. Instead, we should just be grateful that God is guiding us throughout our lives. And that's why I say it's not really reconciled at the end. It doesn't tell us exactly how it is that it feels like we're choosing and yet God is guiding. But it is both of those things, whether we understand it completely or not. Yeah, that's a very good point. Very good point. Yep. And and so yeah, we, and and you're right. This is all on on sanctification here. This is what we're talking about. That's that's for sure. And I hope I didn't make any confusion there with 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 some of the illustrations I was trying to use. But but yeah, no, I think we're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, so, so so I'm like, well, it it gets tricky sometimes. But but we surely we surely do. Uh, want to keep the focus of the motivation for now not wanting to still sin. I mean, just because we know we have forgiveness of sins doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to not want to go and sin no more, as Jesus told uh, the one who was accused for prostitution. You know, he says to her, you know, go and sin no more. You know, you're, you're... And, and, and it's the faith that we want to continue to grow and to uh, and that faith only grows through the wisdom that we receive through the Word of God and His work in our lives. And, and that's, why, that's why we can even talk about this, because we know this because of what the Spirit has led us to believe and know and understand uh, in the Word. And so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting tension. And, and, if, and if there's no tension, if there's no battle, then you better do what James says, and, and you better check out what, what you're calling faith, because it's not genuine. It's not what God is, 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 uh, has given to you as a gift. 
And that's why it's so important for us to continue to be in the Word. That's why that's why I enjoy being part of this program and uh, being part of this, because this is exactly what this program's goal and purpose is, to get people into the Word, to continue to learn God's will, and, and to know that it, it's, it needs to be first, always in our lives, you know, just as the first commandment uh, instructs that we put God first above all things. Amen to that. But that does bring us to the end of the show, but it's a great word to leave on. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Dr. Curtis Dieterding, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida, who has an affinity for soccer, not basketball, and has, uh, <laughs> but is also a wonderfully beloved guest. Thanks, Pastor, for being on the show again. And it's always a joy. Thank you. Folks, tomorrow we're taking on that other section I already talked about in Proverbs, verses 10 through 24. In those, Solomon turns to the monarchy, and he gives us wisdom about leadership, behavior, and speech. He has advice for kings, but also for subjects, and a few more other tidbits about gracious and thoughtful speech. We'll talk about all that and more tomorrow. Uh, But until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all. Until we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word. 